Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Oh, here you go. Fancy new intro for you folks. Hope you like it. Welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism. We're back to old plays and porridges, as you the tour is over and we're back in our usual positions with the usual gang. But we didn't bring a special guest this week because we thought we would just get the gang together and we'd start the show by talking about a wee trip. So let me get the crew in. Let's start. The techies are in place. Both Hazel and John are there. Those of you on the, on the tour, met us on the tour, I've met them both. They're in, they're in the, the, the studio room or whatever. I don't know what they call it. John's back room. Hazel's front room and the... They're twisting the dials and whatnot, whatever they're doing. But let's go. We've got our favourite lawyer, of course, our Eva Comrie up there in Click Manager. Eva, my friend, how are you? Hi, Roddy. Long time no see. It's very been a couple of days. I'm missing you already, as they say. <laughs> and they're from old Ricky, our Lloyd. How are you doing? <laughs> Mr. Cunning, how are you? It's been what, a day? Yes, a busy day, but a good day. Yes, indeed. And uh, over in Brussels, uh, our man Flint, the Coatbridge Cavalier himself, Mr Boswell, how are you? All right, doing pretty good over here. It's a cracking spot, really, really cool. Well seen, the heart of Europe, it's magic. An hour and a half train to Paris and similar to Amsterdam, it's like food's great, Belgian beer. What's not to like? Of course, mate, that's what's not to like. You don't want to be eating trigger. <laughs> well, I'm anyway, here we are. We're back in our uh, our usual old spot, our slot. You know, it's not quite as exciting. There's no live audience. There's no gin pretending to be water in the glasses. It's uh, <laughs> it's just the old usual stuff. It was a great trip. I've just got to say to the viewers, what all those people we met, it was fantastic to actually put faces to the names and uh, I mean, get chat with some of you and hearing what you had to say and think. And you know, there was a a lot of good stuff. You, you may have enjoyed us talking to you, but I tell you what, I enjoyed you talking to us. It gave, uh, certainly me and I'm sure my colleagues, some great insights so that we know what you're thinking. That's the important thing, isn't it, Eva? It was that the feedback we got from our, our audience was, was excellent. The feedback shows a, a number of things that are really significant at this time in Scotland's history and hopefully what we will look back on in a few years' time and say Scotland's journey to independence because every audience was enthusiastic, um, slightly desperate at times, but certainly very determined to see unity in a movement mm. and a drive, a real proper focused drive towards a proper independence campaign. No more messing about or, you know, um, having silly arguments about what currency will we have or will we be in or out of the EU. These are all arguments for further down the line, the, the big deal. But everybody that I could see was how the hell are we going to get there? What's the quickest way to independence? Because we need to be heading there right now. Um, and, and a common thread was every every member of every audience, as far as I could tell, spoke very strongly about the not just the need for unity, but for the need for the people of Scotland to feel that they could participate in and take ownership of the movement and drive it in the direction that the people want to go. And that sounded to me as if the people want to be leading the politicians, which quite frankly is a positive change. So a, whole, a huge amount of information to assimilate. And from my perspective as a candidate, listening to these views will help to shape the campaign that I and other independent candidates run. And I hope that some of the party politicians have similar listening exercises and do what it is that the people want them to do. Because in Lloyd's famous words, we know that the people of our country want independence. Mm -hmm. We do indeed. Um, and you're right, we, we do need the postures and solutions. We, I don't want to make out as if well, we're the ones with a, we know better than everyone else, but we do listen to our viewers and our, our audience. And it's their questions that we answer. We don't sit, when we go on tour, it's their questions. And Phil, there were some cracking questions that we were, we were posed. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was it was so grateful for for that kind of face to face and <clears throat> the feedback and it's not as if we don't listen all the time because the comments matter we we read them and 
<coughs> and the people that contact us privately, um, it's wonderful to hear, and, and the negative ones. You know, if we're not reflecting what you feel, let us know. Even if you're a yun, but you can also jog on in the same <laughs> sentence, to be quite honest. But we will listen, you know, because, you know, even, even a broken clock's right every now and again. And that's the tragedy of an incompetent government with the SNP, because they're making an incompetent government look good. But more of that later. Um, no, it was fabulous. Uh, and I wish, I wish I'd seen more of it. I mean, there was some really good looking sheep in that intro which reminded me how much I miss Aberdeen to be honest but uh, <laughs> I honestly it was a great I loved I loved up being up in Aberdeen and up in Aberdeen sure it was fantastic so I'm really pissed off that I missed that one cracking folk uh, great crack and I even went to see I took my son because we were up there adjusting coming back from the Middle East and I turned him into an Aberdeen fan and went to, went to the, the away end, the family enclosure. And it was great. Went even with the final when they, it was a bad game, but it still beat Inverness Cali to get a cup. So it was great. Great memories of Aberdeen and the, and the fun up there. So, um, no, I, was, uh, I really missed that one. But all they were all great and I, I'd have loved to have been to, the, to every one of them. But sadly, you know, demands mean that you can't do it. But... The fact that people are resonating with what we're trying to do and the fact that we're listening and trying to reflect what we believe is the will of the people, as Lloyd and Eva have stated, it matters, you know, because we all lost a lot of heart when the uh, SNP betrayed us. And it's just, it's a very difficult thing to contend with. And to see the, initi the initiatives that have come up and the inventiveness and of, of these different initiatives to get the people back in power, because that's what made 2014 so good. That's why we all connected with it, because we were part of it. And actually, we ended up driving it, because the, the, this, this one bandwagon in particular, the one the road to independence, was so big and so powerful, the politicians had no choice but to climb on board. That's what made the difference. You know, usually these are invented by strategists and con men looking at statistics and um, what they believe they get from surveys, like uh, you know, Cambridge Analytics, all these types of people. And they're created. And then people are persuaded through media and other ways to claim on board. But no, we created our own for once. And that is that is the thing that I agree with Eva and, and Lloyd. I found most encouraging about this. It was fabulous to actually meet more people of that ilk who were on the, we were on the same side in 2014 and were realising that the deliberate division that is has damaged us, has damaged our, our progress, needs to be healed. And how we do that? Well... We talk about it a wee bit later, but it certainly means getting rid of the shysters and the con artists and those who have betrayed us, particularly within the SNP and anyone else for that matter who's even contemplating it. Don't <laughs> think about it. <laughs> well, we did. We, the one thing you missed out in Aberdeen was uh, our tech air, John, found a baker's that opened at nine o'clock at night and closed at three o'clock in the morning and <laughs> come in with a steak bake. And he came in with a steak bake. It was the you get a row, eh? I, well, I'm, I actually got to tell you, we just finished a beautiful meal in the Italian restaurant. Most of us were sort of full up, but not our techie. He came in with a steak bake. Uh, yeah, he Class, some, John. Class. He, take, he takes some food in that, boy. Um, but the other thing is, there was people from uh, from the SNP, from the Alba party, from the IS, from no party at all. They were all there. But there was one thing I would say, talking in the unity, there was one person who, I won't mention their party, but they'd been to two of our shows and said to me they had resigned from the party because they were sick of watching people attacking um, the people uh, who have left the party. They saw attacks on people in this show and elsewhere, and they said, no, nah, it wasn't for them. They were, they, were, they were sickened by it. They wanted the unity more than anything. And this show, Lloyd, that's what we did. The Earth theme going round on this tour was, you know, we need to unite the people. It's the only way to beat the Brits. And that always get the biggest applause when we said that. Let's have a united yes movement. And that that generated the most applause every time. Absolutely. But that was that was the the, the really heartening message from everybody. And I think what 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 I really remember is the number of people who said, Well, why don't they everybody just talk? Why don't they get in touch? Why doesn't Humza pick up the phone? Why doesn't Alec pick up the phone? Why can't we get the movement back together? And I think if if they're listening, let's let's get this done. People want to be united. There's a there's a, a clear understanding amongst those that were active in 2014 and become active since then is that only collectively 
can we deliver what the country needs? And anybody standing outside of that in some ways damns themselves by doing that because what they're showing to people is that they're more interested in themselves than oh, yeah. the collective desire of the country. I mean, that was that was, that was you know my 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 first trip out on the road with a prison bunch, and it was fantastic. I'm really sorry I missed Perth. I really would have liked to have been there, uh, particularly with Sally Hughes. Uh, it was interesting though for me to to watch it. You know, not having been there, but the the overall attitude, the positivity that's out there, which is unfortunately not being reflected by the elected members, it's no. it's difficult for people to understand. It really is, and let's hope maybe over the next month or two that uh, some people begin to think in a slightly different way because the positivity is there, the the tools themselves for the coming campaign are being developed, and the ideas are being developed. Let's put all the other stuff to the side. Let's just get. Scotland United as soon as we can. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Do you have a lasting memory there, Eva, something in particular that you enjoyed? Oh, well, like you, I, I was at the Mall and they were all good. So Dunfermline, Dundee, Perth, Aberdeen. I particularly enjoyed Perth because, to my great surprise and delight, several of my cousins who live in that area attended, and that was fantastic to see them. One mm. I, is an ex-cop. Um, so great to have them there. Um, Dundee was lovely because Dundee always is and you always feel you're in the centre of something that's going to become rebellious when you're in Dundee and you hear Alan Petrie giving it loudy. Um, but Rianne gave me that most beautiful present, a limited edition certificated scarf made by the pattern of the Declaration of Aunt Row, which naturally I'll be wearing tomorrow. Um, so these events were lovely. Um, really inspirational actually at times. And I think it's really important for people who watch us here every week and they know the kind of stuff that we think about. It's important to take on board what the others have said about the positivity that there is around these events. Because although we criticise what folk are doing or tell them what they shouldn't be doing and try and point others in the right direction, there is a real feeling amongst the people of the country that things really have got to change. We cannot stagnate any longer. We need to have a purpose. We need to have an electoral event. And if the politicians are going to bring forwards towards us, for example, an early Holyrood election, then we have to turn the Westminster general election into that electoral event. And that will be, rightly or wrongly, the focus of the energies of very many activists within the movement who might want to see change happen more quickly than perhaps party politicians think they're capable of. I think, again, the politicians have to take the lead from the people because there's a hunger and there's a thirst and there's a real desire in Scotland for change, not unlike what we felt in the proper summer of independence in 2014, heading in that direction. And I would like this to be a summer of independence in everything that we say and we do in the movement, not just a name, not just a slogan, not one of 11 different points in a plan, but something real that you can feel the heart and the soul and the spirit of the country and the movement really coming alive so that maybe we will, um, as I said, I think in Aberdeen, this year on Hogmanay, be singing Old Lang Syne in an independent Scotland. Mm. Oh, wouldn't that be lovely? Wouldn't that be lovely? I've got to say, my sort of the thing that made me the happiest was the hotel in Aberdeen that said, we keep the bar open until you go to your bed, sir. I thought, I love that. <laughs> and we took good advantage of it. We did indeed. But um, to get on to, to things, Lloyd, um, the, the parliaments are closed on both sides of the border. Not that I would think the general public will notice much difference. It's, uh, it's uh, just the same as usual. But there's only the, the two things that have dominated the news this week. And we are, after all, a review programme. And the one is uh, the hate crime bill was launched. The question I would ask, Lloyd, is did it die at birth? Uh, let's hope so, but I, 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 I think my fears are being uh, unfortunately realised. There's a the, the, the heels are being dug in. It, it, we're in a terrible situation here where politicians that we currently have don't seem to understand that uh, admitting you're wrong is not in politics a sign of weakness. It may be according to John Wayne in cowboy films, but it certainly ain't in politics. It's actually a sign of strength. 
to turn around and say, no, we got something wrong, let's just leave it and we'll we'll move on, we'll change, would be a, a remarkable statement. And I think we'd give a positivity to our current government. But my all the indications are they're digging their heels in and making uh, and making life extremely difficult for the police, uh, extremely difficult for the people in these uh, so-called third-party uh, reporting centres, and frankly, making a mockery of our country and our legal system across the world. And it's 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 horrible to see some of the things that are on social media coming from all eights and parts of the of the globe, looking at Scotland. Us with our own unique legal system, and we are the laughing stock of the world. Mm -hmm. Something has to be done. They they really need to sit down and you know put a moratorium on this right away and redraft. That's the only way forward. Yeah, uh, the thing was filled at the, just the night before um, the launch on Sunday. The, the independence movement was almost in mourning because they thought that Wings was going to close down. He was taking legal advice and it looked like that he was going to have to you know, pack up his kit and keep quiet. But his legal advice actually <laughs> emboldened our, our stew. Um, and it was, and, it's, and I asked the question again. I mean, there was, there's was, there been what I think in the first 24 hours or something, there was like 4,000 um, complaints of which I don't think any of them are going to go anywhere. Is it dead at birth? Should this thing just quietly go away? It won't. It won't quietly go away because it's designed a particular way. I mean, uh, yes, it, I mean, it was a dead duck to your first question. It, it, it was a dead duck from the beginning, but it was designed that way. And it's being executed by fools who don't understand the damage they do by putting themselves and their small mindedness, you know, their, their extreme views before the benefit of the, the people at large. But not enough people have cottoned on to that yet, but they're gradually cottoning on to it. When they actually understand what it says and what it does and what it means, you sensible people who are too too busy to pay attention to politics. And this is this is the apathy that's designed into the system to keep us from getting angry, from to keep us from understanding, to keep us from rising and working together, because it is what they fear. It's entirely what they fear. They know if we get our act together and pull ourselves together like we did in twenty fourteen, we can oust we can change our, our, our institutions. We can make them ours again because they've all they've all been taken over. So I, I loved some of the reports and the the recently the first few days it was open that that Humza useless was one of the most reported under the hate crime bill since the new shambolic twenty fourth. <laughs> it's like come on, yes, get in there. And uh, you know there was a report in even BBC Scotland by Megan Bonner, and she talked about more than three thousand hate crime reports, and this was this was it was just in Monday, and this was like very very shortly thereafter, and uh, it creates new crime. She says of stirring up hatred over protected characteristics. Uh, again, uh, it's horrendous. The large number was about two about two thousand and twenty uh, speech by. Uh, Hamza Youssef, who was a Justice Secretary at the time, remember he talked about the highlighting white people in prominent roles? Well, mm -hmm. the Community Safety Minister, Siobhan Brown, said people were making fake and vexatious complaints. Well, let me think. Having read this legislation, well, that's what the, bazil the, the bill's designed to generate, Siobhan. You know, I, I feel offended, therefore, complain to the police. As Billy, and that's what she's saying. It's like, well, as Billy Conley says, fuck off. Just <laughs> fuck off, you clown. I'll add that one to Andy Billy's comments. I mean, offended indeed. The existence of the current batch of idiots leading and running the SNP that are deconstructing the Yes movement and the once good name of the SNP through moronic initiatives like this one, it offends me. And it's run it runs completely contrary to the principles that made Western civilization the, the modern beacon of of civilization uh, around the world great. And and that's removing the already limited. I mean, remember the right to, to for freedom of speech is already limited and constrained by law. But now you're virtually removing it altogether based on the objective concerns of, a, of an individual who may be quite mental. It's just absolutely crazy. And, you know, and of course, the West is in decline bad enough already. You know, 
down to the user in corporate greed and the work of the lobbyists and the corruption of institutions and the military industrial complex with this proxy war in Russia and, uh, and, and Ukraine and the atrocities being carried out in the Holy Land at the moment. And there's nothing much holy about what's going on in there right now and it's been going on for decades. But it's attacking on, on the fundamental principles, the fundamental principle of free speech. I mean, you, you should be able to speak freely without losing your life. Freedom, you have freedom to express your contrary beliefs, or in this case, simply stating scientific facts that men are men and women are women. And, and we, so we must fight this all the way. So, and it starts, the fight starts by not voting SNP for the foreseeable future. Well, these morons are in charge. And, and you can see the writings on the wall for Hamza because we all knew he's a clown. We all knew he's, he's, he's way out of his depth and he's a. Uh, He's been played, but he's getting what he wants out of it. Big I am, televising all the time. He'll make some money. I bet some deals are done here. I would I would wager that. Some have said uh, that there's some done already, but what would I know about that? But, you know, uh, I know we think of two-bit politics, so I wouldn't be surprised. But anyway, the problem is that it's, it's the Westminster elections here. So the slime balls in the Scottish government, like Hamza and Nicola, who still pulls the strings, which is just as well, because Hamza has proven himself to be incompetent time and time again, you know, um, and therefore incapable of managing anything. And, and, and all of the current Scottish cabinet, they, they need to go as well, which is just a big council. They all need to be gone. And anyway, but back to the issue. Police Scotland said complaints about Mr Yusuf's speech were assessed at the time with no crime committed and no action to be taken against Hamza. Why? Because the new law doesn't apply, apply retrospectively. Otherwise, it would. It probably would. But anyway, uh, Prime Minister backed in JK Rowling over this. That's a good thing. But again, this spring comes back to what I said earlier. These SNP leaders and those that have infiltrated the SNP are doing the will of those who would keep us on our knees by playing right into the hands of the establishment. Consider the contrast. When Alex Salmond was in charge, he was up against the likes of John Maywell, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, who despite their faults, were smart and relatively capable. And Alex showed them up and illustrated that not only could we run a, a competent government ourselves, but with even within the limitations of default government, we could function properly. Contrast that to Nicola, Humza, Matheson, Gray, and the rest of these chances, up against Boris, Liz, Truss, and Sunak, and their incompetent governments, <laughs> and yet managed to make them look good? Oh, Jesus Christ, GRR, fairies, hate crime. Nicola and all her ilk have betrayed us and should pay the appropriate price for that. Ah, should do. Eva, um, we all know that the, G, the, the the hate crime bill was actually brought in to support the GRR bill. When that fell and, you know, when the when Union Jack stopped it, should they not have just, I mean, after you were thinking after the deposit return scheme and the GRR, they would have just said, just dumped them. Why did they go ahead with this? It was, it was just nonsense. It was, it's, it's reason for being was gone. It's because they're thrown and mm -hmm. people like Nicola Sturgeon and Hamza Yusuf simply do not have the character or the spine to admit when they're wrong. So the rest of the country has to suffer and the mm -hmm. country's reputation internationally is traduced as the result of their own arrogance and at times sheer bloody ignorance. There's a, a very good article I read this week by Jim Sillers and he's, the headline is we must all resist this hollowing out of our democracy. And that's exactly what the hate crime legislation comprises. And it's interesting if you, you compare the comments that have been made following the acts coming into force with the comments made before it came into force. So to begin with, it was groundbreaking legislation designed to attack a rising tide of hate crime in Scotland. However, when you start seeing the complaints rolling in and the issues about the three, four, six thousand complaints that have been made and how they might be vexatious, all of a sudden it's become just a little minor change to the law here and there and folk have blown it out of all proportion. The facts for Hamza Yusuf, as we said, I think in Aberdeen, are that hate crime in Scotland is not on the rise. In some aspects, it's reducing. Um, particularly in relation to reports of hate crime um, in relation to transgender identity, 
which is the, the one that they were really trying to target. So what you find over a period of time too is that the position of the police has become ever more untenable. The police, unfortunately for them, had until I think a few hours ago was the last time I checked. On their um, website, they still had the guidance from 2021. It had not been updated. Earlier, it was noted that the police thought that belief was a, a defence, if you like, to a comment that you might make. When belief is not a defence, religion is. So the police got it wrong. The police were also um, claiming that they would be recording and investigating every incident and they were going to record non-crime hate incidents. So we've had the controversy of Murdo Fraser. Imagine being on the same side as Murdo Fraser. No. Who discovered, was told um, that he was the subject of a police record for a non-criminal hate incident. He was told that formally. He then inquired what was the outcome in relation to the complaints against J.K. Rowling and Hamza Youssef, because apparently neither of them are being recorded as having committed non-criminal hate incidents. And lo and behold, today Murdo Fraser was told that there's no record against him after all. So if you thought the police were in a guddle last week, they're in much more of a guddle this week. But it's probably not their fault. It's because the legislation is so very badly written and it's still good to refresh your memory, go onto the website of the Scottish Parliament, read the bill and read the verbatim transcripts that there are of every single committee appearance when Hamza himself gave evidence. His then deputy, Ash Denham, as she was then, Ash Reagan as she is now, I don't think she gave evidence and I couldn't find any speeches that Ash had made during the passage of the bill through Holyrood, uh, the Parliament itself, through the Chamber. However, you can see the record of voting, and you see particularly that all the sensible amendments that would have avoided a lot of the controversy were all kicked out by the SNP and the Greens, and actually some of the sensible amendments proposed particularly by Joanne Lamont and supported by Joan McAlpine, for example, were voted down by the SNP and by Labour, etc. The biggest, most important omission, of course, is sex, so that misogyny is not part of the hate crime legislation, and it should have been. It is abundantly clear that it ought to have been in there, but instead of including that, Hamza's plan at that time as Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Nicola Sturgeon's plan was to get Helena Kennedy to compile a committee and to write a report on whether or not misogyny should be a standalone crime or an aggravator. You don't need a committee reporting over a period of several years to tell you what is as plain as the nose on the face of every member of the population of Scotland. Clearly, sex should have been a protected characteristic in the hate crime legislation. It makes no sense otherwise. Um, it ought to have been there. You could write a misogyny bill if you wanted to in half an hour. I bet you Joanna Cherry could draft it for you in 10 minutes. It is not a difficult job to do. The problem here along with all the other mistakes that the SNP and Greens have made in the last few years, is a lack of political will to do what the vast majority of the people of the country who are sensible, decent, peace-loving, ordinary folk want. And that is to have laws that represent and reflect our democratic values. And silencing people who think that they're not allowed to say a man's a man is not the way to go about it. So I think it's plain to all that, yes, there's been lots of vexatious complaints. And the issue for so, folk like me is not that we've committed crimes, but that we will be investigated for something that is a simple act of free will, free expression or thoughts, even within your own home. And the punishment is in the process. The anxiety and the stress of being interviewed by the police, having to get a lawyer and wait for weeks, months, years on end to get your devices restored to your possession and to know that you're not going to be prosecuted after all for making a remark which by no stretch of the imagination turns you into a criminal or a danger to the public. Yep, it's been an absolute utter mess. I don't think it will last long. I think it will fall by the wayside very quick. I think like the OBFA, it will be repealed. It's just, it's a bad law. It's as simple and straightforward as that. 
Um, but Arthur Techie, can you stick up? You got come out with a poll this week, Lloyd. And for the first time in 10 years, that's the one. The first time in 10 years, the Labour Party, the British Labour Party, uh, you know, full of Scots born English nationalists, has for the first time ever taken the lead uh, in 10 years. And they're showing that they're going to win like 28 seats, um, the SNP 19. Uh, was it 28 seats to Labour, 19 to the SNP, 5 to the Tories and 5 to the Lib Dems? They're not, include, they're not including one for Sally and one for Eva, but we'll come to that later. Um, but but it is indicative of how bad things are going for the SNP that the useless Labour Party has hit the front. There's no question about it, Roddy, but it's it's to do with the disconnect. You know, we're just start talking about the, the hate crime bill, which is a massive example of their utter and complete disconnect with the majority of the people. They have a connection with some people who make up very small minorities uh, in our country, but they appear not to really understand what the needs of the people are. And I think that's partly because during the period of Nicola Sturgeon's first ministership, there was no desire whatsoever to talk to the ordinary public. They only wanted to talk to people who they considered to be on side. So we had the, the packing of our third sector and our voluntary sector uh, with, with people who agreed with Nicola Sturgeon's ideology on certain things. And now, you know, here we are with the, with the people effectively saying, you've had your chance, we're going to go back to what, to what we know because we know that they're no very good, but we've just discovered that you lot are no very good after this period of time. I think the biggest difficulty that the Scottish National Party has at the moment is the fact that it shuts its ears to everything. It's, mm -hmm. you know, everyone can say what they like and they're going, la, 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 la. They, they don't want to hear. I mean, there was an, something really quite absurd mm -hmm. happened yesterday. Hamza's on one of his, you know, in the recess kind of tours. So he's he's up north, I think it was in Dingbo, and one of the one of the women's rights activists in, in Dingbo turned up with a t-shirt or a, rather a poster which said uh, woman, adult human female, and directly asked Marie Todd, a uh, junior minister or minister, I can't remember which she is, uh, what's the problem with this slogan? To which Marie Todd said, it has many meanings. It can be offensive to many people. I mean, what, what, what mystery universe does this woman come from? What hidden meanings can be in adult human female means woman? I mean, it it, it shows you that, 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 that the le it, again, the same word again, it's the level of disconnect. These people really need to get out and about and talk to some real folk and allow themselves to hear what they don't want to hear. Because, you know, Nicola's whole whole kind of methodology, her whole kind of modus operandi, was only to ever listen to people who already agreed with what she thought. Now, if you do that for nine years, then you end up with a whole bunch of ministers and members of the parliament who think that's the way politics works. And that's, you know, that that's what we're discovering now. The, the other thing this week was... Uh, Lynn Tammy Connolly has had a freedom of information request returned, which shows clearly that the, the, the so-called Minister for Equalities, who refused to meet with Lynn because the civil servants had told her not to meet with her, in actual fact is the Minister who's telling the civil servants to give her an excuse not to meet her. Now, if you couldn't have a clearer example of disconnect from the public than that, you know, it, it's extraordinary. We need to get back to having people who understand. Being an elected representative is exactly that. You are a representative. You can only represent if you listen to what people are saying. And mm -hmm. then you can represent their views. At the moment, we've got a whole bunch who appear to think that the majority of the population are their enemy. They have a paranoia based on that. And they can make statements like I've heard five different ministers say over the past week that there is a rising tide of hatred in Scotland, that there's hatred everywhere across the, the nation. That can only come from people that, frankly, haven't been in a supermarket queue lately and haven't been out at the football.
Mm, I agree, absolutely. Um, I mean, in 2017, Phil, the, 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 the vote didn't switch back to the unions. So the, the SNP lost seats because Nicola deemed that we weren't to talk about independence or event, not put independence in the campaign. And the thing that motivates the vote, the voters, is independence. Not, you know, not GRR, not not anything else. It's independence which motivated. Now, I believe that's going to happen again. The last opinion poll I saw, which was on independence, with the fifty-three percent, thirty-nine for the SNP, one percent for Alpa, which meant thirteen percent of people who vote independence are going to sit at home, and that's going to allow Labour to win seats by default. Uh, and that's the problem, and that's why Indy first have stepped in. They believe they they can try and maybe scoop up some of that 13% and keep them voting and keep the independence vote as high as possible. But it is down to incompetence. It's down to people saying, well, I want independence, but not with that lot. Yeah, yeah. And the, the big thing for me in 2017 was that um, it was incompetence, but it's deliberately incompetent it's designed that way it was the first not the first but it was another sign first big major sign that nicola had sold us out and sold us down the river when in, when independence the reason d'etre for um god i'm in brussels i better get the pronunciation of that one right um that was 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 gone you know the whole the reason that we exist as a party the smp did was for independence nothing less and that 2017 debacle of a, it was a shambles of a, I, 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 I just, I just I, we couldn't understand it. We really couldn't understand it. And even though at the time, I can't remember what the, the majority we had in Coatbridge, but it was like 14,000, I can't remember. It was, it was, uh, it was a, and over 10,000 anyway, it was significant. And they thought, oh, you should be okay. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. The swing we got was like 17,000. So why can't it swing back if we are idiots? And uh, that's exactly what we did. We were idiots and it swung right back. Um, so no, uh, it, it's appalling to see these people in and it needs to be highlighted. They're not going to lift the phone, they're compromised. They're working for the other side. They're working for themselves. And the other side, they've got the claws into them and they're doing the will of the other side. You cannot trust them. You should never trust them again. Because if they can be mm. bought and sold for English gold now, then they can be bought and sold for somebody else's gold, gold further down the line. So screw them. Get rid of them all. The clean out has to happen. There's no excuse for this. And I'm not even I'm not going to ask them to start listening to the people because they won't. Because they're compromised. And if you're compromised, you're looking after yourself because you know what's at stake. And like same as the alphabet women, they could go to jail, should go to jail for what they've done. That should come. And, and these dirty dealings that have been done by, I believe, Nicola and her ilk, and some of the people that were the, the Procurator Fiscal's office that were infiltrated by, we know some of these people who they, who they used to work for and what they did. And um, hopefully that will all come out in the, in the wash. But um, these people who have betrayed us, betrayal is a very, very serious matter, especially in something as fundamental as the right to govern yourselves when it affects the very core existence and, and, and denies us the life and the choices that we make that we want for us and our people. So no, 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 I'm not, I will not compromise on this. You can all jog on. Um, and, and, you know, you go back to the whole hate crime thing. Remember Hamza and the health, when he was health secretary and his abuse of power, when he accused, I think it was a Sikh family or an Indian family, uh, the nursery the discrim of discrimination. And it was a 30,000 case against the nursery he accused of discrimination. And he, him and his wife, who was a counsellor, oh, oh, how did that happen? Oh, well, your mum's his wife, is that right? Oh, Jesus, come on. Well, let's say this, that's another sign that these clowns are at it. They claim to have been told there was no space for their daughter at Little Scholars in Brody Ferry. Anyway, it was like, and he alleged, and this is going back to it, he alleged applicants with white-sounding names were accepted a claim the nursery denied, run by Sikhs or, or Indians or something like that. It's like the couple's legal representative confirmed court proceedings had ceased, right? So they, they, it had been lodged in November 21. But separately from this, you see how this ra rails against Hamza. The, 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 that race card has been played and played very badly because there are legitimate, this is the thing, it's doing a disservice to those 
scumbag to, to the people who's, who are victims of the scumbag racists that are out there. You know, you're, you're, it's con counterproductive. It's counterproductive. And, you know, and, and see this from the, the Indian Council of Scotland, who know a thing or two about racism. Um, and it's the, the and I've got to read a wee bit of, of it out because it's magnificent. And it was a Mr. Lal, I believe. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I know. Well, you read it yourself. The, so it was the. The Equity and Human Rights Commission of Scotland is a duty to ensure public bodies foster good relations between different ethnic groups. And this information could incite, and this is Neil Lal, the President and Chairman of the Indian Council of Scotland. We are deeply concerned and offended for everyone who's affected with this hate crime guidance by the Scottish Government Police Scotland. This is racism to its core, in my opinion. And this man, as I said, he knows a thing or two, having grown up in the 70s and 80s about racism, which quite rightly we have, you will never get rid of it, right? But but we're fighting and we've done very well. More to do, but, you know, and there's more to be done in this. But they, they asked, the Indian Council have asked the Police Scotland, we, we hold the First Minister accountable, along with Police Scotland, for any form of racism, because it's not acceptable. I mean, absolutely brilliant. What I loved about it, though, the, the, the bit that they came out with when they talked about uh, the, 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 the prejudice against young white males. And it's, 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 it's like prejudging. It's like any trial can be compromised. If you put something in the public domain that may affect a juror or whatever, well, Eva could explain this a hell of a lot better than I ever could. But even even, as, even the cops, we know this, you know, you can't you can't be doing stuff like this. And here we are. And, and there's no wonder the shamble, the shambles continues to shamble on. It's an absolute disgrace. And and not only that, I would urge you to read that post by the Indian Council for Scotland, because they they, they went on and they asked the uh, people check check the screenshot of the research and check the link of the research they did into this. These guys are professional. They know what they're talking about. It's a subject very close to most people's hearts. Any decent soul will will fight. Uh, racist and racism um, and these guys know a thing or two about it, have done their research and it's there for us to see and they're accusing Hamza of, and, and the Police Scotland and this initiative of being racist Mr Lal uh, take a bow yeah, it certainly adds to why um, Eva, why the, the Labour Party by opinion poll are showing a bit of a lead against the, the SNP I mean, the SNP could address this, they could address the problems and they could try and reverse the problem. I don't have confidence that they're going to do anything different. It seems to me like any government, same as the Tories, they're not going to reverse before the general election. It seems to me that the SNP are just going to plod on regardless. Or can you see them turning and you know starting to grow up a bit? I know that they could turn and they could learn to grow up a bit, but I think that they're we're more likely to behave like petulant teenagers because that's just mm. what they've tended to do over the course of the last few years. Mm. But you see, the SNP have only themselves to blame if people turn to other parties, particularly Labour, because it's the SNP who have made their campaign slogan, vote SNP to get rid of the Tories. <laughs> and the SNP have also said that they want to do a deal with Labour. And we've had this announcement from Hamza that he'll ask for another Section 30 consent for a referendum. I mean, I, I see Phil and Hoy's faces, but really, he thought Grand Prog Day has not got a look in. So it's Hamza's fault if people are thinking about turning to Labour, because why would you bother voting SNP if you're going to get Labour cooperating with the SNP? You might as well just vote Labour in the first place. If you the SNP's raison d'etre remains independence, then that should be the strap line. Vote SNP to get independence. Then they explain how you get independence and why you want independence. And you can do it very easily by saying we want independence for equality and for prosperity. That's it. That's the line. I mean, that you know, the, the literature writes itself. Um, the economic case for independence was won long ago. There's a cultural case for it. There's a traditional case for it. It's all there. What doesn't need to be there is either the Westminster leader of an independence supporting party or an allegedly independence supporting first minister bolstering the prospects of somebody like Sir Keir Starmer 
by telling folk, let's get rid of the Tories. You might as well just tell them, as I said, just vote Labour. But if people turn away from the SNP, it's because they see that they are not delivering competent government in Scotland. They see that SNP voices in Westminster are generally not heard. SNP voices in Westminster are generally the subject of ridicule, particularly from Phil's friend Penny Morden. Hmm. So the Scottish voices that are heard in Westminster and are respected in Westminster are mainly, with a few notable exceptions, not within the SNP. Yeah, I think you'll find that the most respected Scottish voices in Westminster are Kenny McCaskill, Angus Brendan McNeil, Joanna Cherry. It's certainly not Ian Blackford, and it can't be Stephen Flynn, no matter how many press releases you read that say Stephen Flynn is holding the government's feet to the fire. Exactly <laughs> what did that achieve for Scotland? That didn't butter many parsnips. It doesn't feed anybody, it doesn't keep the electricity on, and it certainly doesn't keep the oil getting refined in Grangemouth. So the SNP actually deserve to get absolutely shafted at this election, but I hope they don't. I hope that what happens is they pick up the phone to the likes of Alex Salmond, Colette Walker, and all the other independents supporting people that are prepared to stand as independent candidates and talk sensibly about an independence coalition and a convention. Because as we say every single week and we said it in every Prism Roadshow, we need to have that convention to create the pathway to attaining and regaining our country's independence. The people need to participate in these events. We need more than all under one banner rallies, good though they are. We need people to see responsible politicians and responsible civic leaders with ability and intelligence and vision and ambition, being able to draw the country and make people really visualise the country that Scotland will be when we are independent. Will not be Norway or Denmark or Sweden or Finland or France or Australia. Will be a wee bit of all of them rolled into one with a kilt on it and a saw tire and a damn good future to look forward to when we control our resources. That will not happen if we have party politics in Scotland within the independence movement continuing to be fractured, scoring points off each other instead of getting together and being better together for Indy. Hence, Indy first. Absolutely. And on Indy first, I have it on very good. In fact, I know it for a fact that another independence candidate is going to be announced in your neck of the woods, Lloyd, in the old Reiki. There is an independent candidate come forward and over this weekend, certain things will be put in place. Um, and his party that he's in with at the moment, I think you probably have to be informed. But he is, uh, we have a, a person going to stand in Edinburgh and there's other people um, you know, throughout the country who are starting to um, stir, shall we say. Um, but we do need it. Um, now, the clock's kicking on. There's a couple of things I want to discuss, guys, because... Uh, and I'll do more of it, um, uh, more importantly, midweek, Lloyd will do um, global things. But this week, we can't let go by without talking about what's going on in Gaza. Um, and Teki, can you get ready the, the video of Sir Alan Duncan, a Tory MP? I don't often, again, get in the side of Tory MPs, but I have a great deal of sympathy for, for Mr Duncan. Can you stick up that video, Teki? Thanks. A lot of people at the top of our own politics who refuse to condemn settlements and therefore are not supporters of international law. And I think the time has come to flush out those extremists in our own parliamentary politics and around it, some of whom are at the very top of government or have been, and they have never been called to account by journalists and the press to say, well, do you agree with your own party's policy? Do you condemn um, uh, illegal settlements? And I will name them now. That the Conservative Friends of Israel has been doing the bidding of Netanyahu bypassing all proper processes of government to uh, exercise undue influence at the top of government. So what you have is a lot of people now sitting around Rishi Sunak who are giving him appalling advice. Uh, let's start with the head of 
um, uh, CFI, or has been for many years, Lord Pollack. In my view, I think he should be removed from the Lords because he is exercising uh, the interests of another country, not that of the Parliament in which he sits. Joined, I have to say, by Lord Pickles, they're the sort of Laurel and Hardy who should be pushed out together. But at the top, I mean, slightly improved by the removal of Robert Jenrick and Suella Braverman, although even today she is still supporting Israel and the bombing and the annihilation of people in Gaza. And she does not believe that settlements are wrong, nor, I suspect, do Michael Gove, uh, Oliver Dowden, and a pretty Patel, by the way, should be reinvestigated for her visit. We still don't know who paid for her trip when she came back and tried to change government policy as a result of going on a secret trip without actually telling her officials or even the local ambassador. And if you pick up Wikipedia and you read the entry for Tom Tugendhat, who is our security minister, it says, and I'll read it out, he condemned the United Nations Security Council for its official criticism of Israel's building settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories. Now, that may have been some years ago, but he's never removed that. He's never changed his view. How can you have a security minister in the British government who does not believe in international law when all this is going on. I think he should be sacked. Quite a statement from a and from a Tory. I just go on before I ask you to comment on this, Lloyd. Uh, so Alan, Duncan, Alan Duncan went on to say, although I've heard nothing myself, I've been told by many in the media that the Conservative Party has issued a statement to say that I am to be investigated by them with a view to expulsion. Um, they did not lay out any substantive grounds for their action. If this is indeed the intention, I will probably be the only other person to be reproached for upholding the party's policy for defending the principles of international law and justice in the face of others who would undermine them. And if I just add on that, um, I think about that, the 600 UK lawyers have written to the government, Lloyd, um, saying, you know, we really need to view this because the ICJ have said, a genocide is probably being or is being committed, and we could be party to this. We should stop arms sales immediately, and we should stop. It's in our law. We've signed up to an agreement. Um, there we go. Thank you, Techie. We've signed up to a, a treaty that says that we will do everything to stop any kind of genocide. And they said we have to start acting within the law. Um, we do, but they're not going to, are they? No, they're not, because the Israelis have carried out a. Uh what they would term a defence and security policy, which is to create influence within parliaments across the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the power of uh, the Israeli lobby in the United States is, is a quite, quite extraordinary through APAC. Uh, it's becoming very clear here that uh, Labour friends of Israel, Conservative friends of Israel, are, as, as Alan Duncan said, they are carrying out the policy of the Israeli government. They are not carrying out the policies of their own party. The way that Jeremy Corbyn was treated by the Labour Party, whether you agree or disagree with his views, was without doubt uh, a great achievement for the Israeli security services and they lauded it. Indeed, there were editorials in Israeli papers which praised the efforts that were made by the embassy and through particular individuals in the Labour Friends of Israel to remove Jeremy Corbyn. Now, this is something which is, is happening. It's happened in Australia. It's happened in Canada. It's happening in, in, in many, many places in the world. And it, it is Israeli policy. And it's part of their Defence Department policy, which is that if you, if, if you effectively control the political narrative relating to Israel in other countries, then you won't have to worry about how they're going to vote at the United Nations. You're never going to have to worry about how they're going to vote in the ICJ, for instance. And this is a this is a stated policy they've been carrying out for upwards of 40 years. Now, what we really need now, and I think Alan, Alan, uh, what, Alan uh, the Don't Tory minister, ex-minister, ex was saying was that you can't just... Uh, change the government policy with regard to arms if you don't actually change the the attitudes and behaviours of members of your own party who appear to be cheerleaders for foreign governments and not cheerleaders for 
their own government. You know, th there's a bigger clean out required here. And uh, just to, to finish on one thing, there's a very, very interesting article written by Danny Morrison uh, and presented at uh, the Birmingham Poetry Festival just last week. Go and you'll 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 find it if you if you put it into Google. And what he's talking about, and it's a warning, and it's a warning for us too. He's warning of what he sees is the increasing influence Israel is applying on Ireland in, by different means, clearly with, a, with, with, with the intention of preventing a Sinn Féin government in the Republic, because Sinn Féin's stated policy is that they will recognise Palestine and they will move within the United Nations, if they become the Irish government, to have Palestine created as a full member, and also that they will expel the Israeli ambassador, and that they are fully and completely behind the, the, the campaigns of boycott against Israeli goods and investment. Now, if Danny Morrison, a man who knows just a wee bit about politics, has already had it in his ear that this is beginning to happen, and I would suggest there are similar influences being applied both in Wales and in Scotland as well, but a much, much lower level. We all need to be on our guard. Israel defends itself beyond its borders, not just within its borders, way, way beyond its borders. And it is, as is clear now, it is as rogue a state as I've witnessed in my lifetime. They make the Burmese, the Myanmar military government, look like positive pandas by comparison. I would go further and get myself into trouble and say I can thank my government in the last century they go beyond. I'm not going to say that. Um, but you talk about the, the Irish Sinn Féin want to throw out the, uh, the ambassador. Um, Techie, could you stick up the UAE? They have just done that. The UAE has just all diplomatic ties. Now, they were very close to Israel, the UAE, um, and have kept close ties. They've now said enough. Uh, and I, I, I doff my hat to them. I doff my hat to the UAE who have had the courage to do this. It's exactly what we should be doing, Phil. Every respectable nation who calls themselves a democracy, who believes in the rule of international law, this is a genocide. It's not if maybe it could be, maybe I know. It's a genocide. Um, and every decent human being of a decent nation should be kicking out of them. They should be getting kicked out of the FIFA, kicked out of UEFA, kicked out of the Olympics, kicked out of the Eurovision. They should be absolute pariah state until they start behaving properly. Absolutely. And uh, I've, I've seen the Mayan government in action in country. So understand exactly what Lloyd's talking about. And rem but remember this, Starmer is in the same boat. Labour are no different mm -hmm. in spite of the no, part reversal sure. to stay a, a revolution from within. And even, even pro-Israeli supporters and those like me who agree there should be an Israeli state, these people are coming around. These people are coming around to the fact that this Israeli government have gone too far. And it is policy is... Even if you're a Zionist, a strong Zionist, you should understand, as warned by many, that this policy is now working against the cause of Zionism. Because the whole world is waking up to this genocide. And opinion now leans heavily against Israel and, and continues to lean heavily against Israel. So some of my Israeli friends, and let's remember, the Israelis themselves are divided on this. There are many within Israel who do not believe this government. Look at the Hasim, the Hasidic Jews, who, who, who have real strongly against Zionism and there's there's some support a two-state solution but others are resigned to their belief that there will never be peace while Palestine exists while it exists and we have to ask ourselves we, we've got to ask ourselves what if they're correct what if that's what they think and that's what wins in Israel because it seems that's what that's what's happening right now of course Nothing justifies the atrocities that continue to be carried against uh, the Palestinian people. But it's also highly probable that this extreme persecution is working against the Israelis. And there's, there's high profile individuals who are very pro-Israel, like Colonel Douglas McGregor, McGregor in America, who's a strong critique, uh, a critic of, of both the actions of the Israeli government and, and what's going on in Ukraine on the proxy war this is real this is really government's actions mean that israel needs protection from itself that's mcgregor's words and you know and 
And that, that sounds crazy when you think about what is actually happening in Gaza and the starvation and the genocide and the horrendous wrongdoing. But there's also some truth in that a state that has that has achieved so many great things, but it's very, very hard to argue against what's the, the, the rising critique against the methods that are put into practice by this, particularly this Israeli government. And um, the tide of world opinion is turning. And you'd like to hope that people will not fear reaction for protecting human life, the human yeah. existence and trying to do the right thing. We've, we've got to, you've got to be accountable. I mean, now I'm walking through uh, the heart of Europe, Brussels, and it's, it's an interesting place. And I saw a protest by people supporting Gaza. And most, and I watched, and most business people just walked by and some people shook their heads. A lot of people, you're thinking, and it's more the, or they're creating a big scene. Most people are still ignorant of what actually is happening here. And I think that's that's the big thing. We need to inform ourselves of what's happening in this world, who's pulling the strings, and where we go if we fall into the trap of believing what the media tells us. But that's the problem, as I said, in Ukraine as well, as in, in Gaza. Our media is corrupt, the Western media, not just the UK media, the Western media is corrupt and owned by the people who are benefiting from war because there's no money in peace now. Everyone knows I'm a peacenik, I'm anti-war, you all know that, everyone knows that. But here's the thing, Eva, um, this week three Brits, ex-British servicemen who were working for the World Centre Kitchen. Now there's really always a mistake, I would, I, you know, one, one missile would be a mistake, they were hit with three missiles. And three ex-servicemen, ex-British servicemen were killed, volunteers for an NGO who they are feeding the poor, uh, feeding the hungry, the people. And the Israelis wanted, as part of their, uh, their genocide, to stop people getting fed and getting relief. Now, I, I would just say this. If that had been the Russians that killed three British ex-servicemen who were trying to feed the people of Ukraine, can you imagine the outcry in the Western world? And yet nothing has been done Nothing has happened about these three Brits. And there was an Australian, a Pole, and I believe an American and a Canadian who were killed. It's a disgrace. I think it, it goes back to what is it that Rishi Sunak favours and what does who does he support and why? What outcome does he want to see? Because there are very strong suggestions that David Cameron, um, in his capacity as Foreign Secretary, um, wants some sort of strong message sent to Israel and it's Rishi Sunak who's the stumbling block. That seems to be at least one of the reasons behind the the letter from the lawyers that was submitted to the government. Now, that is a massive step in its own right because the, there were more than 600 signatories to that letter, but it's not just a letter, it's actually 17 pages long. And in essence, it, it's really a, like a very lengthy detailed legal opinion set now where the United Kingdom's conduct is now in the eyes of these lawyers wrong and the signatories include three former Supreme Court judges you know the highest top legal brains in the entire United Kingdom one of them was um, Lady Hale former president of the Supreme Court and what these people are saying is the situation in Gaza is catastrophic. The ICJ found a plausible risk of genocide being committed and the UK is legally obliged to act to prevent that genocide and to reduce the risk of that occurring. And the opinion goes on to set out how you, the UK would be reprehensible and liable if these events are allowed to continue to unfold. So if you look at these deaths and the actually very, very minor amount of publicity that there's been for them, take that in conjunction with this letter and the meaning of that letter, the significance of that letter, what it narrates is that there is something extremely rotten at the heart of the British establishment and it's sitting in number 10, but it's supported, that, that, that rot is supported by Keir Starmer and others, very important people, some of them in the Commons, some of them in the Lords, and some of them hiding in the back rooms that we don't know about, but we know what they're up to. And these are just many more reasons why Scotland needs to get the hell out of this corrupt union. Because I believe 
that if Scotland were an independent country, we would be writing letters as Scots, Scots citizens, Scots lawyers, our Scottish Prime Minister would be making representations along the lines that Sinn Féin have said that they would make, because that seems to be generally the thoughts of the Scottish people, that they're against this continuing what looks like uh, a genocide and we need to see a permanent ceasefire and the return of diplomacy and proper talk about a two-state solution, not the wiping out of generations. And, you know, we kids being left orphaned, not just orphaned, losing brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, dozens and dozens of people just absolutely wiped out, innocent people unnecessarily losing their lives. If these are not war crimes, then... Where the hell is humanity going wrong? There needs to be accountability internationally, and it should start today. Here, here. That's another thing, folks. If you want to see not to be associated with a genocide in the foreign wars, the proxy wars of America, and doing what the, the English want to go to war. Independence is another reason. The clock, again, my dear friends, has beaten us. Um, I hope, ladies and gentlemen, you've enjoyed this as much as we have. Um, and until we see you again, please, please take care. Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.